You've also done studies on the link to, and you mentioned it before, to trauma and abuse. Um, could you just expand on that and how it affects the whole maternity? Yeah, I think that's that's a 25 year research program that we have done, and it's been a lot of publications, and it's been very gratifying to see the change in the way physicians look at it now. Uh, back then, when you mentioned that uh, they didn't want to hear about it, they felt uncomfortable asking about it. And nowadays, it's standard for residents in medicine to ask about this because of its impact on um, on the health condition. So back then, we were starting to identify that patients with the more severe symptoms often would disclose, if you had proper communication skills, this history of physical or sexual or emotional abuse. And that then led us to do um, a survey in our clinic. And what we found was that up to 50% of women who came to our clinic reported a history of abuse, very different from the general population where it might be 10 or 15%. That led us to do a NIH study where we began to find that not only was it reported, but a history of abuse would then lead to more severe symptoms. Fast forward 10 or 15 years, the work of brain imaging was beginning. And we were finding in brain imaging that patients with irritable bowel had an abnormality in an area of the brain called the cingulate cortex, and that abnormality was associated with greater symptoms. So we came up with the idea, maybe the history of early trauma or abuse might in some way affect this area. And so what we did is a study with brain imaging, and we then showed that patients with an abuse history who have more pain also have an abnormality in, the, in this interface between emotion and pain regulation. That then led to additional work looking at the Gulf War vets. I was on the Institute of Medicine Committee that looked at the Gulf War vets who came back with uh, post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. irritable bowel syndrome, and we found the same thing, that these, the, the trauma of war can affect regulation between the brain and the body, or brain and gut. And as a result of that, now uh, the VA system will provide um, compensation for soldiers who develop these conditions. Whilst your expertise is in gastroenterology and psychiatry, do you see uh, any connection between psychiatric, or the, when you said the brain-gut interaction, presumably there's also a brain-cardiac, brain-lung interaction with other symptoms. Yes, but <laughs> yeah. no organ is as hardwired to the brain right. as the gut. You have, in the embryo, you have the neural crest, and the neural crest differentiates as the embryo forms into the brain and the spinal cord, and the spinal cord sends down ganglia in the embryo into the GI tract. And that forms its own nervous system. So we have what's called the enteric nervous system. There are as many nerves, neurons, in the gut as there are in the spinal cord. No other organ has that rich a connection. Just think about it in everyday life. Someone is about to give a speech, they may get diarrhea. They travel out of the country, they get constipated. Why? because they don't want to use toilets in other places. So they hold back, they condition themselves. Um, so um, we know that there's a close connection between the brain and the gut, much more so than other organs. Right. And it goes both ways. If you take uh, rats and you stretch their bowel and produce pain, the locus ceruleus in the brain fires. This is an anxiety center. And patients with GI disorders often, particularly pain, often have a great deal of anxiety. This is commonly seen. So we have to get away from that dualism. We have to say that you get into a vicious cycle. You have IBS, you have pain, you have diarrhea, you're fearful of incontinence, that produces anxiety. It produces, uh, as I mentioned, hypervigilance. You don't want to leave the house. You want to know where the bathrooms are. Your anxiety lowers your pain threshold. It makes your bowel symptoms worse. So you're caught in this vicious cycle. This is how the brain gut is, is dysfunctional and how we try to repair it. Now, I would also say that psychiatric comorbidities do exist. The vast majority of people with IBS do not have abnormalities and they're functioning very well. 
But some of our research has shown the ones who go to the doctor with more frequently with more severe symptoms usually have comorbidities of anxiety, depression, somatization, and things like that. Yeah. So they're really caught in this vicious cycle. And you have to really have to work with their emotional state as well as their physical state.